Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me today, I have a very special guest, all the way from the home of the NFL champions, Kansas City. But before we get to that, how about a little of this? Today, we are very happy to be featuring There's No Crying in Baseball by the good folks over at Evil Genius Beer Company. This is a delicious, hazy IPA with natural mango. This is lighter than expected and very crushable. It's hazy and at the same time, refreshing. It's in a league of its own, garage grade. I have always had a fondness in my heart for the peeps over at Evil Genius. So four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And we have a couple of beer shout outs to get to. First up, a big cheers to Amanda in the Windy City, living it up in Chicago. And last but certainly not least, we have Kaylee, who is on active Air Force duty in Omaha, Nebraska, but originally from the great Believe Land, Ohio. Cheers to you, Kaylee, and thank you for keeping this country great and safe. Both Amanda and Kaylee helped us to fill up the old garage fridge this week by contributing to the beer fund. And for that, we thank you. And speaking of beer, if you can get to the greater Columbus area, come on out and have a beer and a conversation with me and your good friend, the captain, at the one and only Brewdog Dog Tap, April 29th. Tickets are available at truecrimegarage.com. And as the smart people say, that is enough of the business. So gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. her so much. Kim Brown, back at the place where her daughter was killed three months ago today. I wish we'd have answers. I just can't understand. I just can't understand how this could have happened. Tuesday, June 4th, around 5.15 in the evening, 33-year-old Kate Brown and 40-year-old friend Carnell Sledge sitting on this park bench when they were shot in the heads. The killer vanished without a trace and has not been identified. We have no idea who did it. We have just no idea. And that's upsetting. That's horribly upsetting because Kate and Carnell aren't here now. As a result of this abrupt, violent act, I mean, and why? Kim says she believes Metro Parks Police and the FBI are doing all they can as they actively investigate. It does pose new difficulties So with each passing day. FBI Special Agent Vicki Anderson says detectives want to hear from anyone who was in the park that day or who has heard anything that may help. She says it's still unclear if the killer knew the victims. The people that were in their circles, you know, who were they talking to? Um, who did they last speak with? Their family, their friends, people online. The, we've run all those things. Uh, we continue to work those angles, but the stranger possibility still exists. The Metro Park says police have upped patrols in the area. Kate's family putting up signs pleading for tips as they await answers. This couldn't have happened totally in isolation. Somebody knows something and I'm hoping somebody will step forward. very special night here in the garage. I'm very excited. I'm joined here with my longtime friend and host, my favorite host of the Generation Y podcast, Aaron. How are you doing this evening? Man, I'm doing great because I'm hanging out with you and getting ready to discuss an important case. There are very few places better to be than in the garage. And I welcome you and I'm glad that you are here with me this evening. Yes, this is an important case. This is a scary case, and, and when I review this case, I'm reminded that there simply are cases that I think are more frightening than others, and here what we are talking about tonight is a double homicide that takes place in broad daylight in a public place, 
So it certainly makes one take pause and really acknowledge that unfortunately this terrifying situation could happen to any of us at any time. And unfortunately, no one is immune to being a victim and we can't keep our guard up everywhere all of the time. Now, the story starts off like this. It's a beautiful Tuesday afternoon at the Rocky River Reservation. This is a metro park in the greater Cleveland, Ohio area. We have two good, wholesome people who were gunned down that evening. Now, this has become one of the area's most infamous unsolved homicide cases and an investigation that truly has no easily identifiable motive or suspect. It happened just after 5 p.m. on June 4th, 2019 in a parking lot area north of the Lorraine Road Bridge in the park. According to authorities, our victims, Carnell Sledge and Kate Brown, arrived at the parking lot around 5.04 p.m. They arrived separately. They got out of their cars, and they went and sat down together on a nearby bench. The two had been friends for more than a decade, and from my understanding, meeting there at this location, at the park anyway, was not unusual. Now, police say sometime between 5.08 and 5.15 p.m., an unknown person or persons shot them. Kate Brown's body was found in the water, so this park bench is right near the Rocky River. It's, it's directly in front of the Rocky River. And her body is found in the water. She has been shot once in the head. Carnell Sledge was found on the ground nearby. He had been shot multiple times in the head, according to authorities. Just minutes later, at 5.18 p.m., two kayakers are in the river. They're going upstream, downstream, what have you. And they find these two bodies and they call 911 immediately. Now, Aaron, this is crazy because think about that really short, brief time frame that we're discussing here. The authorities have managed to narrow this down to parking in the lot at approximately 5.04 p.m. I do want to state some things here. First off, right off the rip, there's not a lot of information, not a lot of details that have come out about this case from the mouths of law enforcement since this case broke, since this unfortunate incident back in June of 2019. However, online, there are multiple reports from different media news outlets. And some of these times do vary to a very small degree. So I've seen it reported that they parked there as early as 502. Uh, this report that I chose to use is saying 504. And then we have the kayakers discovering the bodies at 518. I've also seen that it reported that the 911 call came in at 522. So we all can agree, though, that we are still talking about a very small window of time from the time that everything was fine. Everything was normal. Everything was great. Just another beautiful sunny day in the greater Cleveland area. And then unfortunately these two are gunned down in a Metro park of all places. Yeah. The timing of that, it really suggests this is just from my own analysis here, of course, that they were followed that it has that feel. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And okay, the other exactly. thing, the other thing that really strikes me here is people often say, well, I need to meet with someone. I'm going to meet with them in public because it's safer. Mm -hmm. This is a well-trafficked area. Yes, it is. And yet it didn't help this situation at all. Whoever did the shooting was not afraid to do this uh, with many people going by. A well-trafficked area. And that is, so if you look this up on a map, we have Lorraine Road, which goes over. There's a Lorraine Bridge that goes over Rocky River. They would have parked their vehicles in a parking lot that is very near and underneath sort of that Lorraine Road Bridge. And then walked over to this bench, sat down, 
And the way that the crime goes down, the murders go down, as explained by law enforcement and the news outlets, is that it is believed that they were both seated at this park bench when the first shot was fired. Now, what's crazy to me, you say well-trafficked area. This is not just well-trafficked area. We're talking about cars going over the bridge. This, there's multiple lanes in both directions on this bridge. Cars going over the bridge. We have people that are going to the park, going to and from the park. It's June in Ohio. That day, I believe it was mid-70s, around the time that they were killed. It was a Tuesday, which would give you a little bit less traffic as far as the park's concerned. But there's also the Metro Police. They're not housed too terribly far away from this location. The thing that shocks me here, and... They've done about four press conferences that I could view and listen to throughout the years on this case. They've opened up every one of those press conferences to questions from the media. And the Metro Parks Police, they're fielding those questions, and they don't offer much up in the way of A, details about the case, or B, information that they know. And I get it. It's a catch-22 situation. You're holding the press conference to ask the public for their help and for information from the public so you can solve this case, so you can get justice for Kate and Carnell and their families. But then on the flip of that, you got to hold this some information close to your vest and what little information you probably have it's it's one of those situations where they have some information that's confirming for them approximately what time they parked their cars. They have information, something that's telling them that they were shot at approximately this time. Now, I get it. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out, of course, they had to be shot before 522 or before 518, before the 911 call was placed by the kayakers. But... I want to know where some of this information comes because you talk about heavily trafficked area, both cars, people on foot. We even got kayakers. We got people walking their dogs in this area, people on bikes. Somebody at that time of day, given that amount of traffic, we have to have some ear witnesses is what I'm thinking. Well, why don't we have those people coming forward? Because as far as we know, There haven't been, have there? The information that I was able to review states that they have received over 100 tips on this case. And that was a statement given by the Metro Parks Police and the FBI, I believe in 2020 or 2021. So I would make the assumption that they've received some other tips since then. I don't, you know, it's difficult to say without knowing what that information is, how many of that 100 or so tips were helpful. Um, But that's what they're stating to us. Now, I say that you got to have some ear witnesses because just the kayakers alone, because we're being told that the police believe and have likely have reason to believe if they're this specific about the times They're stating that sometime between 5.08 and 5.15 p.m., an unknown person shot both of them. And then by 5.18 or 5.22, the 911 call is placed. So is it something just as simple? I would think that at the very least, those two kayakers would be potential ear witnesses before they stumble upon this horrific scene. And it's possible there are ear witnesses. We just haven't been told about who they were and what they heard. Sometimes that information gets out. In this case, like you're saying, the Cleveland Metro Parks Police, they've been very quiet, and they're not releasing much. One thing we have been told here is that robbery does not seem to be a motive. And we're basing this off of the idea that Carnell's wallet was still on his person. Kate's purse was found where they were sitting. 
and Carnell's laptop was still in his car. So items of value were not taken from the victims or from their vehicle. Yeah, that tells us something right away. And when I was reading about this for the first time, when I first learned of it from you, it really struck me as the kind of case where it felt like a targeted attack. That's what's very odd about this case, because we have some statements from law enforcement. They were very quick to say, we have no reason to believe the attacks were random. That's one thing they were saying right from Jump Street. They were stating they believed it was an isolated incident and that the general public or people going to the park were not at, uh, in any danger or at a safety risk. Now, again, you want to know what they're basing that off of or if they're basing it off of anything at all other than just sheer st- statistics. I mean, most or could it be something else, Nick? You've seen yeah. the movie Jaws. <laughs> yes, I have. And you know that was part of the film where someone gets attacked and killed and they're reassuring all the tourists, no, it's fine. You know, don't worry about it. It won't happen again. Exactly. And that's what I wondered. It, were they basing that off of, well, the statistics will tell us that most homicides, the overwhelming majority of them are isolated incidents. Person A has a beef with person B and attacks or kills them. That's usually how these things play out. But that's reasonable, isn't it? Given the timing of this. I mean, this, one of the questions early on was, was Kate headed towards the river just because she was wandering away for a moment to look out? That didn't seem likely because they hadn't been there long enough, right? That's something that might happen if they had been there for 25, 30 minutes, but not if only for what, three, four minutes. No, she was probably trying to get away. I agree with you. And, and you're exactly right, Aaron. That's, that was the speculation, or at least it, it wasn't law enforcement statements, but that was the speculation that was coming out earlier in, in this case and in the investigation there were people saying that Carnell was seated at the bench and that Kate was up either looking into the river, maybe skipping a rock or something of that nature. Carnell is shot and killed. And then Kate is shot and killed and falls down the it's, it's of course a little bit of a a ravine, like into the, into the river there. So this river, like, like all it fluctuates in depth, but it's, it's rather wide. And at the time of the homicides, the water was pretty shallow. And so when you see, you can check out news stories, online news stories of this case. And in the more recent ones, the river's quite higher at the time. And the park bench looks like you're like two feet from the water. But when this, when these homicides took place, the river was rather low. And it's my understanding that she fell down into that, that space, into the dirt just before the water. And so unfortunately her body would be extremely obvious to those kayakers as they were coming by. There are so many questions. You can literally come up with multiple scenarios of what could have happened. Uh, Just because I think she was trying to get away because Carnell was suddenly shot doesn't mean that's exactly how it happened. We don't know. I'm just basing it off of the timing of everything. You also could question if she fell down and would be more exposed to other people, perhaps that meant the shooter didn't have time to do anything else and had to leave. Yeah. So one thing that's come into question here is the nature of the wounds. And we do have some information from the Cuyahoga County medical examiner. This is Dr. Tom Gilson, Dr. Thomas Gilson. I've personally met Dr. Gilson on a couple of occasions. So the nonprofit that I work for, the Porchlight Project, we have worked hand in hand with the Cuyahoga County medical examiner's office on a couple of cases. This dude is a stand-up guy. 
you know, we, we look at these cases, you and Justin, the captain and I, we look at these cases, a new one every week. Sometimes they're unsolved cases. And when you have a case that goes unsolved for a year, two, three, this one coming up on four years now, you do question the investigation. And I think that's fair to do so. I mean, citizens do, why can't podcasters do it? So I think it's fair to do so. I will give my humble garage opinion here on this gentleman. If there is a problem with this investigation, it's not coming from Dr. Gilson. I've, as said, I've met with him several times. When you talk about level of give a shit, go ahead and put that at a hundred for Dr. Gilson, because he has personally taken out time of his busy work day and, and spent time and resources from his office to meet with the Porchlight project on several cases, that being of some unidentified persons, unidentified remains, and even a homicide, a couple of homicide cases. So this is somebody that is willing to go the extra mile and, and meet with, with some people that are eager to help and assist in some of these unsolved cases. So, uh, coming from his office, the reports that I've seen state that Carnell Sledge unfortunately died of multiple gunshot wounds to the head. And to be a little more detailed about that, most of the reports state two shots to the head. Catherine Brown or Kate Brown, the reports are that she suffered one gunshot wound, which killed her. And some of the reports state that it was a singular gunshot to the head. Yes. And so when you and I had spoken about this uh, about a week ago, you thought that that told you something. That Kate was shot once while Carnell was shot at least twice. Yes, I did. And I, the thing was that when we spoke about it, I was a little unclear about the where on the person they were shot. And it sounded to me like if, if we were talking one gunshot to the female victim and multiple to the male victim, my suspicion on that for, for a period of time anyway, was that maybe she was taken out first and then he had an opportunity to respond. Now, what we can say is it's obvious that they were attacked from behind. Now, can I say that they didn't see the killer approaching them? No, we can't say that. But what we do know is based off of information that's come out, Carnell was in the seated position or or seated at the bench just before the gunshots started. And I think you're spot on with your statement there, Aaron, of of the belief of possibly Kate was attempting to to flee. You know, uh, this all went down very quickly. And I'm basing and backing up what you stated off of some information that I discovered recently. This is from uh, Cleveland News 13 in a statement that says the family of the victims said that Kate was shot running for her life. So that Cardell would have been shot while still seated at the park bench. And I don't think she was up by the water. I think she was sitting right next to him, had a split second to react. She got up and started to go. And it's still a shot at relatively close range. The momentum carrying her forward and pushing her close to the river, falling over that, that, that it's a, maybe a few feet, a bit of a ledge there leading down to the Rocky river. Yeah. So once again, I think we need to talk a bit more about the timing because one of the things I learned was that this was after five o'clock and Carnell wasn't supposed to be at this location, at least according to his family, he was supposed to be at his grandmother's house. No, I haven't. And Aaron, I do want to apologize. It was Cleveland 19 news. I think I said Cleveland 13 there just a second ago. This is interesting to me, right? Because Given the time period, five o'clock, that's the time when we think, okay, you're just recently off of work. Uh, What is this meetup here for? And there, there's been a lot of speculation by the public 
as to what this meetup or rendezvous would be for. And law enforcement has been pretty clear, and the families, both families, have been very clear. These two knew each other. They knew each other for an extended period of time, had known each other for 10 plus years. I've even seen statements that it was not uncommon for them to meet at this. The statements are this location, but can we say this very park bench? No. Um, I think we we should probably generalize, generalize that a little bit more and simply say it was probably not uncommon for them to meet at this park. What's interesting to me, though, is a statement from Kate's family that said that she frequented the park uh, with other people as well. So that would lead me to believe possibly this was a location of her choosing. Right. So if we put that together with, uh, again, this is just speculation, but if Carnell was supposed to be over at his grandmother's place and people were trying to reach out to him, asking where he was, why are you not over here? This might have been something set up not too long prior to when they got there. This might have been a last minute thing and that would make you question why were they suddenly meeting at this park what's up with all of these ufos lately just last month the military shot down three ufos and we still don't know what they are High Strange is a new investigative podcast that searches for the answer. If you've ever wanted to take a rational, modern-day approach to the topic of UFOs, then you absolutely need to check out High Strange. Get ready to dig into the most famous, unexplained events of our time with exclusive audio tape and interviews with real people who experienced them. A real active investigation that presents you with all the evidence challenges the narrative and leaves it up to you to decide what to believe. High Strange is hosted by Payne Lindsay from Up and Vanished. Payne takes a fair and unbiased approach to this subject, uncovering stories that are both thought-provoking and sometimes terrifying without entering conspiracy land. From Tenderfoot TV, the team that brought you Up and Vanished and Radio Rental, High Strange is available now on all podcast platforms. Search High Strange in your podcast app. That's High spelled H-I-G-H. To binge the season now, subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus. Many parents want to give their children extra academic support, but it can be overwhelming and expensive to get the right resources. IXL offers all the learning tools your family needs on one site, from pre-K to 12th grade making it simple to identify exactly what each child needs to work on. With students learning in virtual classrooms recently, it's not uncommon for them to need a little extra review. IXL is the most comprehensive online learning program covering math, language arts, science, and social studies. It's a safe space for children to make mistakes and grow. On IXL, they'll find videos, lessons, and sample problems to break down tricky topics. When they get practice questions wrong, they'll get clear explanations. And as they master topics, they'll get positive feedback to help them build confidence and have fun learning. Memberships start at $9.95 per month, so it's much more affordable than a private tutor and more flexible. IXL is even proven effective by research. Studies nationwide have shown that students who use IXL are scoring higher on tests. For a limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get 20% off IXL membership. Visit IXL.com slash garage today. Want to learn a new language this year? Rosetta Stone makes it easy to get started, and they'll create a learning plan for you that keeps you on track. Rosetta Stone has been the expert in language learning for 30 years, helping millions of people build the fluency and confidence to speak new languages. Rosetta Stone offers 25 languages from Spanish to Chinese to Polish. With the Rosetta Stone app, you can learn anytime, anywhere, at home, while traveling, or on your commute. You won't be overwhelmed because Rosetta Stone breaks down your new language into bite-sized pieces. Plus, 
Rosetta Stone's true accent feature helps you perfect your pronunciation. You'll get feedback on how well you said specific words compared to native speakers. For a limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get Rosetta Stone's Lifetime Unlimited subscription, which gives you access to all 25 of their languages forever for 40% off. Visit rosettastone.com slash garage today. That's rosettastone.com slash garage. Rosetta Stone, how language is learned. Many people find water tasteless and boring, but sodas and sugary drinks are packed with empty calories. And who knows what all those artificial sweeteners and diet sweetened drinks are doing to your body. Luckily, you can stay hydrated in a healthy way without sacrificing taste with Hint Water. Hint is pure, fruit-infused water. Their unique fruit essences create amazingly accurate fruit flavors. There are more than 25 flavors with classics like watermelon, blackberry, and pineapple, alongside delicious smash-ups like blueberry lemon and peach raspberry. There is zero sugar zero diet sweeteners, and zero calories. It's great for the whole family. I've been falling in love with Hint Water, and I've certainly got my favorites. I like to keep a Blackberry riding shotgun with me in the car to keep me hydrated. And when I'm at the gym, I'm taking with me a peach raspberry Hint Water. Replace those sodas that are bad for you and bad for the kids with delicious tasting Hint Water. You can find Hint Water at retail stores like Walmart, Target, and Kroger. Or you can have it delivered directly to your door from HintWater.com. New customers can get Hint for just $1 a bottle with free shipping when they order three cases. That's 36 bottles for $36 and free shipping. Just use code GARAGE at checkout. Stay hydrated with Hint Water. Check out HintWater.com today. So for those that are unfamiliar with the case, Carnell Sledge, age 40 when he's killed, he is an African-American man. Kate Brown was age 33 when she was killed, and she is a Caucasian woman. This has caused some to speculate, could this be a hate crime or, or something that is race-related uh, or, or, or a racist motivation? Because I think what's weird about this case, to me, it feels like while we have very few details and limited information, I look at this thing and from from the first couple of weeks till where we sit today, I still feel like we're talking about only a few scenarios that are that are likely here. That if it was somebody on foot or on bike or some random person in the park, I see it it would have to be some kind of racially motivated homicide or some kind of thrill kill, or if they were targeted as we're led to believe by statements from the FBI and the Metro parks police department, then I'm with you given the short window there. I mean, they're only there there by law enforcement as little as they're telling us. The one thing they are telling us is they were there for, uh, let me pull this up right in front of me. Cause I want to make sure I hit this out of the park. They were only there between 502 and at, at the at the greatest, 502 to 515, and they're shot and killed. Or the shorter part of that would be 504 to 508, and they're shot and killed. It has to mean that, that, that one of them were followed there. We know that they arrived in, in two separate vehicles. I'm making a guess here that they were coming from two different locations. Somebody had to be watching one of these individuals and, and track them there and not only track them there, but went undetected. You would think they would had to have gone undetected to Carnell or Kate. Right. It, I really believe that they arranged to meet there last minute because he didn't inform anyone. He was changing his plans. Uh, his grandmother was Audrey Corey, 
And by all accounts, that's where he was supposed to be was with her. He took good care of her. This mm -hmm. guy was known to be very caring. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he worked with special needs kids at Empower Sports, and it was all about letting anyone play sports. You know, I, when I was younger, I would try to play sports, and I was always the last one picked because I was so scrawny, and I wasn't very good at sports. But, uh, you know, at his program, it didn't matter who you were, you could play basketball. You know what I mean? Everybody could participate. And so with as caring as he was, I, even his own mother said uh, that he was a, a loving man. He was a God-fearing man. He wasn't perfect, but they were proud of him. And, and Kate Brown, everyone vouches for how wonderful she was. These are, like you said, wholesome people, longtime friends. What would cause them at the last minute to decide to meet at the park like that? Were they just going to meet and talk for a few minutes because maybe Kate had something she wanted to tell him? Maybe she was feeling emotional. Maybe something happened and she needed to talk to someone. And he said, why don't we stop by the park and we can talk about it before I head on to my grandma's house, right? We don't know what it was. Uh, the speculation could take us many places. But what we do know is they were good enough friends that if one of them said, hey, could you meet me at the park? I want to talk about some stuff or whatever. They would both go to the park. That wouldn't even be a question, right? No, it wouldn't be a question. I don't think so, given what we've heard from Kate's family that she frequented the park. Um, her father said that it was a place that she would often go to meet her mother. And what, where my inquisitive mind starts to go is, well, what, what would it be that they needed to discuss in person and in this setting rather than over the phone or through text? And the other thing too, given the timeline of what we're being told of, Hey, we've narrowed down the time of death to this short little window here. We're not telling you that we have any eyewitnesses because if we had an eyewitness, what we would have is a, a suspect description. And I know what you're about to jump in and say, and we can circle back to that here in a minute, but, but to be frank here in the early goings of this case and investigation, we're not told that there is any eyewitness, right? And so to have this very short little time window of approximately seven minutes or 10 minutes, depending on what timeline you go by, of this is when the shots occurred, this is when they were killed. I start to wonder, was there some form of communication was there, you know, a text sent out by Carnell at 507 uh, to to a family member, to a friend or a coworker? And so they know, OK, Carnell was alive and well at 507 because he sent out this text message. The, the thing is, I did not know that he was supposed to be going to his grandmother's house that evening. But what is interesting and what I, I think makes it easy for me to believe that is his grandmother said something so cute and, and you, you knew that they were close and, and he was very close with his parents and close with his grandmother. But one of her statements was uh, talking about her grandson was he loved to eat and I love to cook. And she said it with, the, with this beautiful smile. And um, so it makes perfect sense that Carnell was on his way to see grandma that evening. Uh, who knows? Did he need to be there at five thirty? Did he need to be there at five? We do know one thing. I do know based off of some statements, uh, he was working as a an, an audio technician, audio visual technician for a company. Crescent, uh, Crescent. Crescent. I'd have yes, yeah. Crescent. Thank you. And he, a person that he worked with who he interacted with that day, the day that he was killed said, we, we spoke, everything seemed normal. He was his happy go lucky self. Uh, he was always a joy to be around. No different on that day. We discussed, uh, an expense report or something of that nature, something very much work related. And that person went on to say, Carnell would have left work that day sometime between four and 5. PM. This is at Crescent digital. Yes. So I, you know, so he may have gone from work to meet up with Kate Brown. Yep. That's what we're guessing here, right? Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if knowing why they were meeting would tell us anything or not. Because as we know, if, if someone, if someone is targeting you, it may have been someone who didn't understand the relationship that Carnell had with Kate. That's just one possibility, right? Exactly. And that, I think that is underlined and should be easily understood by everybody and easily believed because as soon as these two poor people were killed, people that didn't know them that were reading about this in the newspaper or watching it on the news were questioning what is the relationship between Carnell and Kate. And we have family telling us they were friends. Now, does do what I expect parents out there everywhere to know what type of relationship that their 40 year old son or 33 year old daughter has with other adults, the details and the specifics of those of the, of that relationship or dynamics of that relationship. No, but again, I think that you could have those two theories that we're discussing here tonight fit based off of what you just said, a misunderstanding of what it is, their rela- what their relationship was or the nature of their relationship on this given day. Yeah. I, it's one thing to try and figure out what happened. It's another to try and look at the people involved to see if there were any clues along the way. And when I was reading up on Kate, it was said that her dad was talking about how she had lost 100 pounds. She was exercising regularly, doing yoga. And he said she was just better than ever. Mm -hmm. Better than ever. So at least as far as the Brown family was concerned, Kate seemed to have everything going her way. Everything was looking up. Because she just was, uh, you know, from what I was reading, she had a real zest for life and she was motivated. And then if you look at Carnell's life, he took great joy in taking taking care of other people, making them feel good. So again, I don't look at this and think they were up to no good at this park. I just think, I think it's what everyone's saying. They were really good friends. They decided to meet at the park for some reason. And like I said, if I had to put, I don't know, a guess on this, it would be one of them maybe needed to talk about something. And who better to talk about it with than one of their very best friends? A trusted friend, a trusted longtime friend, you know, and sometimes when you're going through something or sometimes when you're faced with something, the best person to talk to is one of those. I I know that I have a couple buddies that I've had to deliver the hard truth to them once or twice, and they've had to deliver the hard truth to me once or twice throughout the decades that we've known each other. And, um, there's been times where I've had to tell them they're wrong or tell them to move on from something that's not good for them. And they've had to do the same for me. Uh, there's been other times too, where you just say, look, I'm not, I'm not in a sticky situation here. Nothing's bad with Nick. I just need to talk. I need some advice. I got to bounce something off of you. And those are the people you go to. And I think that's exactly what was probably happening here. What I think is less likely out of the two scenarios that I think are the most probable is I would go 1A and 1B. 1B being the racially motivated homicide. And look, it's not something that's comfortable, that's comfortable to talk about, but it happens, right? It, it, it has happened. And unfortunately it continues to happen. There will always be hateful people in every country, everywhere, but we also have people that do kill for the thrill of it. I don't think with, with given such little information, I don't think it's easy for us to rule out those possibilities. I have spoke to some of the people that are from that area, grew up in that area uh, and and have lived there for for many years. They agree that that would be the second most likely theory here that that they would put forward. The first being that somebody, as you said, uh, was either jealous 
wanted some kind of revenge or did not understand the nature of their relationship. And for that to be the case, I'm with you, Aaron. I think somebody had to have fallen, had to have to follow one of these individuals to the park that day, that evening. And then that makes you wonder and take it a step further. Was the intention to take them both out or was one of the victims just collateral damage? Right. Did they even know there was going to be a second person there or was this going to be a planned confrontation and that second person through their plans awry? Before we get into the, and I'm using air quotes here, you can't see me, but you can feel it with your air, with your ear balls out there, people air quotes. <laughs> Before we get into the eyewitness, Aaron, is it okay if I throw out two of the rumors that were going around. I always, I always, when, when there's a case that has so many open-ended questions as this one does, I do like to put my ear to the ground and hear what some of the locals are saying. And I, I know that it's a bit of reckless speculation, but in more than one case, where a case has went unsolved for 10 years, eight years, and more than one occasion, there has been a local rumor that many were talking about. And then later it turns out to be, well, that's exactly how it went down. Um, so in this case, I don't know if these rumors have reached you. I'm, I'm obviously proximity wise, quite a bit closer to the case being here in Ohio than, than you are in beautiful Kansas city home of the the greatest quarterback known to man, Patrick Mahomes. But uh, the what I heard from the locals is one of two possibilities. That it was either an ex of Carnell's or that Kate had met somebody via a dating app and either Carnell had offered her some advice or maybe had discovered that the suitor or potential suitor that she was talking to may have not been who he says he was. Rumors. There's no way for us to know until, uh, like you said, it could take years. And if this thing is solved, perhaps one of those rumors will have been proven to be true. I do think it's possible that an ex would be involved just because they still are in a certain place emotionally that the other person isn't. Mm -hmm. And so uh, while they're haunted, the other person has moved on and they don't even know that there's a plot against them. Before we get to that eyewitness, let's, I want to talk about something that, that does bother me about the case. And you know what? It's weird because we do these cases and sometimes I get accused of being too much of a blue blood. And then go ahead and tune in next week and you go, all right, well, sounds like Nick doesn't like the police at all. <laughs> I think you look at the, yeah, I think you have to yeah. look at these situations on a case by case basis. And one thing that I try to say and remind people is every one of these cases is unique. None of them fit in any particular size or shape box. They're all very unique cases because we're talking about unique individuals victims, suspects, locations, circumstances. Everything is very unique with every case. Same as the people that are investigating the case. And just like any career or any walk of life or any work, any job out there, there are people that are good at their jobs and people that straight up suck at their jobs. And guess what? That means there are bad doctors out there. There are bad people in law enforcement, but there are also great people in law, law enforcement. Most of them are great. Most of them are fantastic. Now I'm not accusing anybody in this particular case of not being great at their job because I don't know what information they do or don't have, or, or maybe there's simply no information out there. But one thing I, one thing that always kind of bothers me about these press conferences where us, the public, we rely so heavily on what we're being told by the experts and by the authorities. But then they're coming back to us during these press conferences and asking us for help. But then when the media starts to raise their hand and ask questions at the end of your conference, 
and your your answer for everything is well because this is an ongoing investigation i i can't answer that question or and that you're referencing right now police chief Catherine dolan yeah she's the one that was uh hosting you know? these media briefings <laughs> Yeah, and that that has been her answer for everything. So where all these investigations and cases are unique, that answer certainly is not new, unique to any case and not unique to this case because that's the answer I've heard every darn time that a question is asked. The thing that drives me nuts is often, and John Q. Public may not know this or may not have put much interest into it to figure it out. But a lot of times these press conferences are led by either a police chief or in a larger department, you'll have like a public information officer. Typically that person that's giving the press conference standing at the podium, they've not actually actively worked the investigation themselves. That holds true most of the time. I can't say that it's true in this case, but I get the vibe that that's what we're getting here, Aaron. We do. It, it makes sense that the chief would be the one to come forward and talk to the public. But does the chief have the ability to answer these questions? It, it, is she choosing to stand up there and make, make a strategic decision as far as her, her investigation goes and says, well, I can't answer that because it pertains to an investigation or is it, I can't answer that because I don't know the answer to that question. And this is my fallback because the question that, that I wanted to hear the most is a a very astute reporter says, look, there's gotta be surveillance cameras on this road and that road and this road. How many surveillance cameras are there in this location? And were you able to access them? you know what time the victims arrived at the parking lot. So you must have some information. Did you get that from surveillance footage answer? Well, that pertains to our investigation. So I cannot answer that question. Somebody followed them there. I, and, and and I would be willing to, to slap down a, a Benjamin Franklin right now on the table and wager that somebody followed one of these people to the park that day and then went in and shot and killed both of them. Can we, can you pull anything from that surveillance footage? Have you checked all of those bases? And if so, what is that information telling you? Do you have a car of interest? Do you have a vehicle of interest? And that's what we're expecting, that they know some things that they're just not letting us know about. And we wouldn't know until they make an arrest. You had some brilliant information of Carnell was intending to or was supposed to be going to grandma's house and either at the last minute may have changed his plans or this could have just been a brief stop along the way. Do you have any idea of where Kate was coming from? Because we know we do know that that maybe Carnell did not go directly from work to the Metro Park. He may have given that We have a coworker saying he could have left as late as 5 p.m. But that gives us some idea or at least gives us a little bit of detail about his timeline for the day in question. Do you know where Kate was coming from? Do we have any clue on that? Well, real quick with Carnell, they might know based on interviews done with his coworkers uh, what time he actually did leave. Maybe someone does know what time he left. As for Kate, I actually do not know where she was coming from, but she may have been at work as well. I would imagine if she, because typically when she went to the park, they said she exercised at the park a lot. Mm -hmm. But if she drove there to meet Carnell, then obviously she wasn't there exercising. I could not find where Kate worked. I found some information stating that she worked at a jewelry store for approximately seven years. And the way that it was worded made it sound like she was probably still working there at the time of her death. Yes. And that's what I assume is that she was still working there because not only did they say where she worked, but she said she considered her coworkers and boss 
like family. Correct. But if you look, take a look at her obituary, it seems as though she is the kind of person that is good at making friends and is a loyal friend. They said that, and this is in her obituary, once she was your friend, she would always be your friend. She was very loyal. Well, and something that backs that up is what we do know, her long-term friendship with Carnell. If Carnell was coming from work, Aaron, what I'm showing here is if he was at the home office, uh, this would have put him about a 12-mile drive from the home office to where his vehicle was parked. So about a 20 minute drive. If that was in fact where he, if he came directly from work, it would, it would appear to me given the statements of he would have left work between four and 5 PM. That only leaves a very short window of time for him to have stopped elsewhere along the way. So that's where this is at, right? I mean, we know that the Metro park police have investigated this. We know they have had assistance from the FBI. We know that once the shootings occurred, that the park was checked for evidence, but the only things that they admitted to finding were several shell casings from a weapon, and they didn't seem to really want to comment about the footage that would have come from the cameras in the area. They didn't want to talk about the footage that would have come from the cameras. The shell casings would tell us what, because we, we don't, we don't have information about the gun that's released to the public. We're not told what caliber or if more than one gun was used. We can assume that it was not a revolver that given that they found shell casings at the scene, you had found a report that stated three shell casings. That's what I've found in all my reading. It seemed the most consistent bit of information regarding the shooting as far as evidence found were several shell casings, which are three, um, or you might say a few, uh, a few shell casings, three shell casings found there. But, um, and that yeah, goes along with it. some of the, that goes along with some of the reports that he was shot twice and she, and, sorry, that Carnell was shot twice and Kate shot once. Now, right. But I recall you saying you wondered if he was the target. Yeah, and so, that she would be a witness who needed to be stopped. I I wondered that, and I think you could argue both sides of the coin. And people put and and dumb people like me put a lot of psychology into the way that these crimes go down. But a lot of people would suggest that that one of two situations: he would have been shot first because he was the target, or you could argue because he's the man and poses the bigger threat to the shooter that you eliminate the threat first and then take out the target. I would definitely suggest people look up pictures of Carnell sledge. That would give them some idea of why he would have been shot first and that you're correct. Uh, if you're well, when perpetrators shoot people, they often try to take out the person who poses the biggest threat to them. And I would say Carnell would have posed a threat. And keep in mind, the way this goes down, the way that we are kind of explained that it went down or the way that we have to put these pieces together would lead you to believe that they, that either he was seated at the bench or they both were seated at the park bench when the first shot was fired. And so if you are the perpetrator or perpetrators and you have the ability to sneak up behind them, you would unfortunately get to choose who you're going to target first. And as you just said, look up pictures of Carnell and, and given his background too. I mean, he's, he's an athletic looking guy. He's a guy that looks to be in good physical condition. Now, I know you're just you're just chopping at the bit right here, aren't you, Aaron? You want to get to this this eyewitness. 
No, I mean, you've teased it a few times. I think we <laughs> should get to it now because uh, there are definitely people waiting to find out what else is going to happen here because for many people, I suspect, this will be the first time they're hearing of this case. I'm not saying no one's covered it, but I don't think it's gotten as much press, as much coverage as some other cases. And I find that to be a little strange with it being a, the nature of the crime itself. And I, I get it. They don't think it's random. They think it was targeted. Nobody else should be afraid to go to the park. I get all that, but look, I mean, okay, then Metro Parks Police solved the case. Prove it. And I, I'm, I'm not going to, look, I, I'm not going to hold back here, Aaron. I'm a little concerned that the Metro Parks Police, I, I, I reviewed something that stated that the FBI took over the case at some point. I don't believe that to be true. That looked to be more to me to be somebody's speculation on a message board somewhere. It looks to me like the Metro Parks police are still the primary investigators on this case and the FBI is assisting them. There is a local office there in Cleveland, so that is helpful. But the way that I see this going down and from other cases that I've reviewed, you typically have the primary and then the FBI who says they're assisting, it's more of a, hey, we check in from time to time and see if they need anything or we sit down and have a meeting every month or every or quarterly and put our heads together and see what comes about. I'm not going to lie. And I feel bad saying this on a microphone where it's being recorded. I don't feel great that it's that the primary on this is the Cleveland Metro, the I'm sorry, the, uh, the Metro parks police. The police chief says it herself there in the, in the conference, in the first news conference. The parks are a very safe place. We've not had a homicide in our metro parks for over two decades. Well, I don't know how much confidence I have in your experience in investigating these matters, these very serious matters. Now, if it were a situation where I was worried about if people were walking their dogs on a leash or off of a leash, I feel very confident that the Metro Parks Police would straighten that situation out. But this is that's not what we're talking about here. So do you want to play garage guy and lead us into this eyewitness and let me play Generation Y guy? Or should we <laughs> remain in our roles? Well, let's just see what I say. I so there was a letter that came into the media, right? And it went to Fox 8 News. Mm -hmm. This anonymous letter was sent in and it went into detail about the person who had shot Carnell Sledge and Kate Brown. Now they said it was a woman wearing a green hoodie, cuffed jeans, and black walking shoes. And it also said that this woman had words with Carnell before she opened fire. So Fox 8 News got this letter. They turned it over to the FBI. Now, this letter came in months after the murders. But in May of 2021, that's when Fox 8 released that letter to the public. And the FBI put out a plea saying... If you wrote this, please come forward. We want to talk with you. And they got lucky because within a week, a person showed up to talk to the police about it. Now, once again, you're wondering, what could we find out? Because the police have been so tight-lipped. So I would say, take this with a grain of salt because we don't know what they're doing here. Because in any investigation, you have to be careful about what you release. Sometimes they release nothing. Sometimes they release a lot, but they hold a few things back. The spokesperson for the police said that individual told us it was a premonition that they'd had several times and yeah. they felt like it was coming to them and they needed to report it. It was nothing that they had seen. Yeah. And so this got the area in quite a stir, right? So 
when this news broke that they received an anonymous letter and, and, and in fact, the way that the news broke, it almost implied that it was just an eyewitness that came forward. And then, then shortly thereafter, you learn that it come, it came via anonymous letter. They yes, did release that letter. And when I reviewed it, the first thing that I thought was this doesn't sound like a, an eyewitness. And I know you've reviewed these for the generation Y in cases that you've reviewed the words and the way that they were describing things. And, and in particular, I'll read one statement that was in the letter that kind of showed the cards to me that this was coming from a person that believes that they have psychic abilities. It says, they ask a question to the investigators. Now, yes, this was sent to the media and not to law enforcement. So it says none of my business, but none of my business by were, sorry, I'm reading their exact words, which gets difficult. None of my business. I believe they're trying to say, but were the two talking marriage, meaning Carnell and Kate don't believe this was the motive. And correct me if I'm wrong on, on any of these portions here, Aaron. And then they go on to say, I hit a snag. I thought I had a name, but who said the name wasn't Carnell or Kate? It was a white man sitting on the bench with Sandy Brown hair and glasses like Drew Carey. He was looking behind the bench at the woman and he said, quote, for God's sake, Amy, put down the gun. But the more the woman was talked to, the more agitated and irate she became. The I hit a snag was the telling part to me. I thought I had a name. You hear that often when psychics are giving their reports. You know, I'm, oh, I, I thought I was getting a name or I, last time I, I had this vision, I, I saw a name or heard a name. And so when immediately when I saw that, I thought, I hope this psychic, this air quotes witness comes forward to clear up that they weren't actually there that day. But how do people respond to this? How does law enforcement respond to this when someone is coming forward with a lot of information, but then it turns out they dreamed it or had a vision of it? It's the whole, oh, I thought I was getting a name or I thought I was getting more information, then suddenly I lost it. But I do have this much. Well, you want to know why they came forward. And so you... If you are this person, you've just opened yourself up to investigation. And one thing you do have on your side, one thing that I would say you have in your favor as looking less guilty than more guilty would be that you did in fact come forward and say, Hey, yes, it was me. I was the person that wrote that letter. And no, I was not there at the park that day, but I'm just trying to help out. And I've been having these dreams or visions or whatever. And I can't shake them. And I'm maybe I'm just a good person. And I thought I could help out. They look like good people. I wanted to try to help. There's that possibility. There's also the possibility that, and I would think that this would be less likely. I would, I would think that the person would likely not come forward if they were trying to throw a wrench in the investigation. Um, but if it was a, a man of color who was responsible, then of course somebody would throw out the idea that, well, it was this woman that looked like Reba McIntyre, uh, with a hoodie on. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's one of the weird, weirder ends of this case or weirder angles anyway of this case. And at first I didn't know what to do to make of it. And I know that the, the news kind of ran with this anonymous letter for, for a portion anyway, for several months. Well, I think they had to, right? They were wanting to report on this case. The police weren't giving them anything. This letter was the only thing really to report on at that point. Well, and the families wanted more attention to, and rightfully so to their loved ones case. And 
I'm thankful to the media outlets that were choosing to run the story and remind the the people of this case. One thing we should point out too is there's a considerable award or sorry, a considerable reward for money, a money reward here in this case, $100,000. My understanding, Aaron, is that 25,000 of that is being put up by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the other 75,000 is from the family. Yeah, I know that uh, at first the FBI offered a $20,000 reward. Crime Stoppers offered $2,500 for information. Um, later, of course, these amounts increased, including money from uh, the families. So, yeah, it's $100,000. So when you have a crime like this that's so brazen, right, in full view of the public, or you would imagine, and this person got away with it so far, $100,000, you would think that would bring forth some more tips. Someone would want to claim that if they knew something. And what's wild about that uh, anonymous tip, and then, of course, later we learn that it it's not anonymous. The person comes forward. But I remember on the news reports that they were saying that there were some details that they believe that the anonymous tipster got correct. In, in their in their letter. And so it held a little bit of weight, right? It was holding water a little bit, or at least portions of it. And so, again, that's just one of those. I, I don't know. I, I And there are people out there that are shaking their head at me right now. They're like, why would you put any um, thought? Why would you waste your time on it as soon as you hear that it's a person saying that they're getting visions? I don't know that I'm betting much on what they're saying, but I do know that there are detectives that I've spoke to that would say, nope, throw it right out. It's a waste of time. There are other detectives that will tell you, you know what, when you've run out of ideas, you're willing to take phone calls from anyone. Tell me something that's outside of the box. Tell me something that I haven't thought of yet. And Oh, by the way, tell me why you think this. Or do you have any any information to to back that up? I really believe you can't throw everything out. You can't throw anything out. You might take something that came in and say, okay, this isn't going to solve the case for us. But maybe it's a puzzle piece that you don't know how it fits into the whole thing, but it's a piece. So you can't throw it out. I think once you start uh, getting tunnel vision, in such an open-ended case like this, you could definitely make some mistakes. You also have to wonder as a detective, when you look at something like this, why did this person have such a strong desire to, to the point of it becoming a need that they had to reach out, communicate this information to somebody, even though it was a news outlet instead of law enforcement. Why? Why do they come forward? And it may simply be they believe that they're psychic. It also could be more of an emotional response. They feel guilty because they know something or they heard something or somebody they know knows something. And that, too, goes back to this reward money. $100,000 is not a reward that is put together for somebody that was in the park that day that saw something and just decided not to come forward or forgot that they saw something or heard something or did see something and they're too afraid. No, in my opinion, $100,000 that reward is put together for somebody who has direct information from the killer or one of the killers that somebody told somebody, Somebody made a threat. Oh, you know, the, you know, that, that thing that happened to those people in the park. Oh, you know, I could do that to you. Or maybe they were talking about one of those individuals beforehand talking about how upset they were with them. And then they were quiet after the murders. Exactly. Exactly. I don't think that whoever did this and I, 
again, would bet a Benjamin Franklin right now that it was a targeted attack, just as we're being told. I can't figure out who was the target, one, the other, or both. But I don't believe for a second that 10 minutes before this happened, this person decided to do this. I think this likely was something that was building. And as you said, they may have told somebody in advance, maybe not that they're planning to go to the park, maybe not that they're planning to take somebody out, but that they had a beef with one of these people, had a big problem with either Carnell or with Kate. And damn it, they were going to do something about it. And so that's what this reward money is for. Um, So if you're out there and you hear this, stop sitting on your hands, come forward. You know, they have, we have multiple law enforcement agencies that you can reach out to. There's also a dedicated tip line where you can be anonymous. So anybody with information can call the Cleveland branch, the Cleveland FBI branch at 216-522-1400. Or you could call that dedicated Metro Parks police tip line at 440-331-5219. Is there anything that we missed, Aaron, or anything that we did not get to? Yes, definitely. For people that want to know how this may have gone down, they should check out an animation put together by Scott Roeder. He did this in 2021. He's a crime scene reconstructionist with the evidence room, and he used the autopsy report, and he also visited the crime scene to put this together. So I think it's helpful to actually see it. And um, I definitely hope that someone listening maybe can make a difference in this case because that's why we're covering it. We would like for people to think about this case, keep it alive because I would hate to think that Carnell Sledge and Kate Brown died and that their families will not get justice. Aaron, I want to thank you for joining me here in the garage. It's always a pleasure, always a lot of fun. Um, given the circumstances, obviously we're talking about these real life tragedies and the loss of these two great people and these two families are suffering a lot still and, and need the public's help to, to get some form of, in some sense of closure. But I do want to thank you for joining me and, and taking the time out and I'm hoping we can do it again. Absolutely. Anytime, man, you just let me know. All right. Take care. Aaron. Cheers. Cheers. All right, lots of great stuff from one half of the great Generation Y podcast. Our recommendation this week, if you haven't already, go and check out the Generation Y podcast. Your earballs are going to love it. And when you're there, you just might find the captain. If you do, tell him I said hi. We will be back at it again next week. So make sure you stop by the garage and see us. And until then, be good. Be kind and don't let